talented young men gather on a football field in downtown Lincoln. Many leaving the comfort of their small Nebraska towns for the first time. They were eager to represent their state, playing the sport that they loved. They were ready to conquer the radical rule changes and please their head coach. He was a young man himself and understood the feeling of winning a championship. This groundbreaking season would add to the foundation of a college football dynasty. Warren, Ohio, fall of 1880. This small farming community welcomed William Cutler Cole. Some called him Billy, and he would excel in high school and college football for the Marietta Pioneers. He became two-time captain as halfback and graduating in May of 1902. Wanting to further his education, he enrolled in the University of Michigan Law Program. He would start seven games for the Wolverines as end for head coach Fielding Yost. Coach Yost, future Hall of Famer, had a dominating crew. They finished their season undefeated. They outscored 11 opponents, 644 to 12, including nine shutouts. They had 100 point wins over the University of Iowa and Michigan Agricultural, now known is Michigan State, and Ohio State was an 86-point shutout. They were recognized as national champions by the media. Billy Cole interned at a Chicago law firm in the summer of 1903. He accepted his first head coaching job in his hometown of Marietta. He took them to a 7-3 record. After coaching the Pioneers one season, Cole returned to Michigan to coach for Yost. He assisted in yet another undefeated record for the Maize and Blue, getting them the 1904 national title. At age 24, Billy Cole became the Virginia Cavaliers head coach with a salary of $1,800 with the rate of inflation, he made the equivalent of $45,000 per year as a coach with no teaching responsibilities. He took the Cavaliers to winning seasons in 1905 and 1906. Little did Billy Cole know, a new job and a new nickname were on the horizon. King Cole was a merry old soul, and a merry old soul was he. He called for his pipe, and he called for his bowl, and he called for his fiddlers three. Now every fiddler had a fine fiddle, and a very fine fiddle had he. William Cole received an offer from the University of Nebraska in January of 1907. Local media latched on to his last name, citing the 1708 children's nursery rhyme, Old King Cole. Billy embraced it. He was their 11th head coach. Fiddle, 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 went the fiddlers, very fine men are we. There's none so rare as can compare to the kings. Fine fiddlers, free. K 
King Cole was replacing Amos Foster. Cornhusker fans and administration had high expectations. Foster wasn't asked to return after a 6-4 and four campaign in 1906. In his first season, King Cole led the team into the Missouri Valley Conference. They finished 8-2 and, and undefeated in their home stadium of Antelope Field, along with winning a share of the conference title with the Iowa Hawkeyes. They had another winning season in 1908. Seven wins, two losses, and a tie against Minnesota. December 2nd, they hosted one of the greatest athletes of the century. Jim Thorpe and the Carlisle Indians traveled to Lincoln not only for the final game of the season, but the final game at Antelope Field. Corp and the Indians left Lincoln with the win. In 1909, the Cornhuskers moved into their new stadium, Nebraska Field. It was located just south where Memorial Stadium is now, more specifically, under the South Stadium. Nebraska Field ran east and west near the corner of 10th and T Street in Lincoln. 1909 was not a good season for Cole, his team, or the new stadium. They had a final record of 3-3. Three and three. At the new stadium, they had wins over the local Doan team and Knox College, a private school from Illinois. Two wins at home wasn't good enough for the Cornhusker fans, students, or the local media. In the first decade of the 1900s, the game of college football was in its infancy and changing year after year. In the months leading up to the 1910 season, there was a monumental shift in the rules. For the first time, the game consisted of four quarters. Prior to kickoff, coaches decided how long they wanted the quarters. They could range from 10 to 15 minutes. In prior seasons, if a player left the field for any reason, they were not allowed to return for the remainder of that half. Now. There was free substitution at every position. There were a lot of changes on the offensive side. The field once looked like a checkerboard to keep teams from running outside. They were only allowed to run within five yards of the tackles. Starting in 1910, players used their speed to run wide. The field was 110 yards. The offensive team only had three plays to reach first down. A touchdown was worth five points. And after the extra point, the scoring team could elect to have the ball kicked right back to them. Now, let's talk about the forward pass. There were some distinct limitations in its fourth year of being legal. The quarterback had to be at least five yards behind the line of scrimmage. If the pass was incomplete, the ball would be spotted where it was thrown from. If it was thrown more than 20 yards in the air, it resulted in an immediate turnover to the defense. The defense had it easy on rule changes. New that season, pass interference. It could not impede the progress of players on pass routes. And there was the banning of the quote unquote flying tackle. The rule makers were ridiculed and it was said that their attempts were making the game weaker. The rule for tackling was changed. Now players had to have at least one foot in contact with the ground while attempting a tackle. Many sports writers and fans thought without the hard hitting, there was no reason to have college football. Professional gentlemen whose idea of the game are modeled on newspaper reports of aspiring injuries to the game, which really result from causes not directly related to the gridiron directly. High-minded individuals who never exclaim against auto racing or aeroplane meets these have done their best to force on the public an emasculation of the greatest of autumn sports. Kansas Cranks, the worst of all semi-imbeciles, endeavored to drive the game entirely from Missouri Valley Universities. Lincoln Star, August 28, 1910. There was a concerted effort to move the game away from the brutality of 1909. Nationally, it saw 32 young men die from injuries playing football. As with all changes, there was opposition, and many thought that this would be the end of the sport.
Early on, King Cole had made an impression with the Cornhusker faithful. Their faith wavered a bit in years two and three. According to the record books, Cole never had a losing season, but the students and alumni quickly turned on him. Coach King Cole, who has already guided the Cornhusker team in three seasons of varying success, will be on trial. It's the expressed opinion of the alumni and undergraduates of the Lincoln School that King Cole failed to get the results last fall that the material warranted. To his re-election for this season, there was considerable opposition, and the Nebraska Board of Control was petitioned to secure the services of another man for the 1910 season wishes of the students and alumni were given little heed and coach Cole was given another lease on life. This fall with polling and pushing of players abolished interference will be an important factor in the offensive play of the teams more importantly probably than ever before in the history of the game. With the flying tackle forbidden this fall the critics of the Nebraska coach will not be able to censure him for not making his leave their feet in order to bring a man to the ground. All of Cole's critics realize just how the situation stands for this fall, and they will be watching closely every movement of the coach. Cole will have to make good, and making good this fall means turning out a team that will win the championship of the Missouri Valley in order to refute all the damaging statements that have been made. Omaha Daily Bee, September 4th, 1910. Grand Island natives Ernest and Owen Frank helped the backfield look strong at halfback. Herbert Potter and Harry Miner returned as the team's only quarterbacks. 180-pound Harvey Rathbone locked up his starting position at fullback. The line was anchored by Captain Leroy Jack Temple from Lexington. Ponca's Gus Lofgren Osceola's Walter Shawner and Sylvester Hippo Shanka from Abbey. And on the line in their hometown was E.Z. Hornberger, Dewey Harmon. For the early 1900s, the Cornhusker line was larger than most. It had four interior linemen over 200 pounds, which included Hornberger and Shanka, who would play most of the season. Every once in a while, you would see six foot seven inch Ole Stelk and C.T. Ross. Clinton Ross moved from Kansas to study law. Ross would not be allowed to play in many of the states south of Nebraska because he was African American. Two weeks prior to opening the season against Peru Normal, now known as Peru State, the team lost returning quarterback Herbert Potter because he was recovering from typhoid fever. Cole thought he had the answer with Harry Miner until he was not only injured during a rough practice, he was also academically ineligible for several weeks. Cole still needed a quarterback. Along comes Beaver City's Leon Jerry Warner. He could stretch the field with his speed, and he could take advantage of the new passing rules that would be utilized by the offense. Having only been a high school quarterback and being brought in as an end for the Cornhuskers, Jerry Warner would soon become Nebraska's first dual threat behind center. This year, the forward flip should be one of the Cornhuskers' strongest cards. The improvement is largely due to Jerry Warner, Nebraska's new quarterback. In the practice to date, Warner has demonstrated that he should develop into a sterling quarterback. He is a marvel for speed and the shiftiest dodger in returning punts or in skirting the ends. Warner's forward passes have been invariably perfect, shooting the oval with deadly accuracy. Warner is to pilot the Cornhuskers Saturday in their first gridiron clash of the season, and should the Nebraskans run up anything approaching a score, it is conceded that Warner's individual prowess and brilliance will prove an important factor. Lincoln Journal Star, September 30th, 1910.
The 1910 Cornhusker squad was being questioned because of its coach, its players, and new rules. No one would know how they would perform until they took to Nebraska Field in front of 1,200 fans that filled the wooden grandstands. Peru Normal boasted one of the best ball carriers in the country, and everyone was wondering if the defense could keep the powerful Bobcat offense on their heels. In a word, shutout. Opening kickoff. Jerry Warner takes it back 90 yards for the score. Remember, when you scored a touchdown, the ball was kicked right back to you. Fullback Harvey Rathbone would find the end zone six times, with Walt Shawner scoring twice from his left end position. Warner added a 42-yard punt return for a touchdown later in the game, while also completing 12 of 18 passes for over 150 yards. The win proved the team had a grasp on the new version of college football, and King's men lived up to the hype with a 1-0 record. Eleven Cornhuskers took to the field. It was a 3 p.m. kickoff led by their new quarterback, Jerry Warner. Warner was the only man at that position on the roster because backup Harry Miner was out with a shoulder injury. The week prior, Harvey Rathbone handled the ball quite a bit. There were quick passes and outside runs by the backs, so the Coyotes knew what they were up against. Halfback Owen Frank broke free for 50 yards before being caught from behind. Warner would break past the end for another 15 yards to the South Dakota Five. Two plays later, team captain Jack Temple would cross the goal line, running the ball from his left tackle position. It took Nebraska five plays to score. The home team took a quick 6-0 lead. It remained a stalemate for the first half. The Coyotes scored with a drop kick for three points, bringing them back into the contest. Both sides tackled well. A player, identified as Coyotes linebacker and fullback Smith, was all over the field. According to reports, he drove his knees into the ribs of the Cornhusker ball carriers. This happened again midway through the third quarter, when Smith caught Warner after a short punt return. The Beaver City native leapt to his feet and struck the Coyote. Normally, it's the player that retaliates that disqualified, and this was no exception. Jerry Warner was thrown out of the game. Unfortunately, he was jumped by Smith from behind as he walked towards the Cornhusker sideline. The fight was stopped by the referee when he grabbed the attacker and threw him to the ground. Warner would spend the remainder of the contest alone on the bench. King Cole decided to move halfback Owen Frank up to the position because he had no backup quarterback available. Frank added a 45-yard touchdown run in the fourth quarter, and the defense held tight. Sylvester Shonka, Nebraska's powerful left tackle, gave an exhibition of open field tackling never surpassed on a Nebraska field. The Dakota halfbacks are remarkably fast and shifty, frequently getting clear and threatening touchdowns, only to encounter disaster in Shonka's powerful grip. Shonka, by all odds, is the most aggressive forward ever developed at Nebraska, weighing better than 200 pounds and fearless and aggressive in an unusual degree. Lincoln Journal Star, October 10, 1910. Nebraska won 12-9, but at what cost? Jerry Warner was on the bench for fighting. Little did he know about the damage the South Dakota attacker had caused. Two former players from the Minnesota Gophers scouted King Cole's squad in preparation for the game scheduled for Saturday the 15th. This would be the 1910 Cornhuskers' first road contest at Lothrop Field in Minneapolis. During practice, halfback Ernest Frank severely injured his left arm. Cole had no choice but to shuffle his backfield. Cole made it public that Jerry Warner was worth more to the team at halfback playing against what had been reported as an undersized and unpolished Minnesota line. Harry Miner was put at quarter and Warner shifted to halfback after the injury. The chances seemed to favor the lineup with Miner at quarter at the opening of the game Saturday. 
Star Tribune, October 13th, 1910. The college band played and speeches were given as over 1,000 students and fans saw the 20-man traveling squad leave the train station in Lincoln. The starting 11 took to the field at 2.30 in Minneapolis. Jerry Warner lined up behind center. On a side note, Coach Cole had been playing a bit of chess with the Gophers through the newspapers. He had hoped Minnesota practices were planning on how to stop a different version of the Cornhusker backfield. Cole was in for a surprise. The Gopher head coach and the Star Tribune media were on to him. The Minnesota Dope Slingers newspapers have played their last trump in the game, boosting the weights of their rivals while discrediting their own. Last week, they were regaling Nebraska followers this tales of beef in the Nebraska line and that the Cornhuskers actually had the heavier team. When the 2 11 stepped on the gridiron, a blind man could almost see that the Gophers had us outweighed by a comfortable margin in every position. Lincoln Journal Star, October 17th, 1910. The defeated Cornhuskers boarded the train back to Nebraska. It was a 27-0 shutout in front of 10,000 fans. Their first loss of the season. The two first downs. The fumbled punt. The turnovers. Only getting inside the 20 once in four quarters. Gus Lofgren's ankle. Easy Hornberger injured both hands. Jelly Elliott broke his collarbone. Ernest Frank's broken wrist, Harry Miner's bruised shoulder, Walt Shawner's bruised thumb, Sylvester Shanka injured a knee. King Cole had an 11-hour trip home to come up with a plan. The opposition won the coin toss, but not much more. Unlike in Minnesota, the offense was working. In the first four minutes, there were two short touchdown runs, the first by Owen Frank and the second by Dewey Harmon when he picked up a fumble by Harvey Rathbone on the one-yard line. Coach Cole then drew up a perfect fake punt for Frank and Walt Shawner. The play went off perfectly from the Nebraska 10-yard line. Shawner was hidden on the sidelines and pulled in a long pass and took the ball 90 yards for the score. Nebraska rolled up 403 yards rushing and passed for 140. They were 3-1 and one on the season and had four games to go. The Cornhuskers were in a three-way battle for the Missouri Valley Conference title, along with Kansas and Ames Agricultural College, now known as Iowa State. Both of these teams were still on Nebraska's schedule. Not only does a coach manage a team, but has to come to terms with being at the mercy of the university. Nebraska was hiring a new athletic director. There was also news that the Missouri Valley Conference was taking its first step in banning part-time athletic coaches, which means William Cole would have to be a teacher and remain in Lincoln year-round. As of October 1910, there were many questions, but not many answers. Reportedly, Cole was not interested in the rule change that was to take effect December 1st because he had just purchased a 200-acre fruit ranch in Montana. He planned to manage it in the off-season, which he couldn't do if he was forced to teach. Many were worried that Cole was looking past the Doan Tigers to their next battle with the Kansas Jayhawks. The fans were correct. The Nebraska coaching staff openly admitted they were running Kansas plays in practice. The Tigers were given no respect by the newspaper writers and the coaching staff. Despite the injuries to starter Jerry Warner and backup quarterback Harry Miner and defensive and offensive lineman Sylvester Shanka, William Cole thought that game was a guaranteed win. Just hours before Cole led his team to Nebraska field against Doan, the Lincoln Journal Star printed an article from the Kansas City Times. It accused that King Cole was violating the Missouri Valley Conference rule against scouting. The coaching staff made zero attempts to deny their allegations. 
Nebraska frankly admits that assistant coach Ewing made the trip to Des Moines last Saturday and for no other purpose than to watch the Jayhawkers in action against Drake. We did not, however, violate a conference rule. Nebraska's representative proposed the rule at the last conference, but it did not prevail. Graduate manager Earl O. Eager. There was a high school all-star game scheduled to be played prior to the college game. This football doubleheader saw the Lincoln All-Stars beat the Omaha team by a score of 9-6. to six. However, the game went long, and in 1910 there was no outdoor lighting. The college teams took the kickoff after 4 p.m. late in the fall. With darkness looming, the coaches decided the quarters would only be 10 minutes. Nebraska's offense was both ragged and slow, being marked by so much fumbling and lack of energy that most of the game during the first half was waged in Cornhusker territory. Frequent penalties and Nebraska's ragged offense balked the Cornhuskers during the remainder of the battle. The Nebraska State Journal. The 6-0 win most likely saved Coach Cole his job. The Cornhuskers were 4-1 and on the season. Three games remaining against Kansas, Ames Agricultural, and Haskell Indian College. King Cole, the Cornhuskers coach, has mapped out a busy week of preparation for the Kansas game. Cole's regulars were permitted to loaf during most of the last week, facing an apparently easy game with the Doan Collegians, the Nebraska coach eliminated scrimmaging. Secret practice is to be the daily order. Lincoln Journal Star, October 31st, 1910. The Cornhuskers had a long week of practices at the farm facility. All week, King Cole had been vague in who would play, who was injured, and even mentioned he thought the Jayhawks had a chance at winning. Some accused the team of not playing well against Doan in order to confuse their opponents. This game would be the first step in the battle for the Missouri Valley title. The crowd of over 6,000 Jayhawk and Nebraska fans packed the stands for the mid-afternoon kickoff. Jerry Warner led the Nebraska offense. He was flanked by halfback Owen Frank, all-purpose athlete Harry Miner, and Harvey Rathbone. The Kansas coaching staff thought Nebraska would come out passing. Instead, King Cole drew up an offense that was mainly running. Warner, Frank, and Rathbone led the attack. Each had long runs of 30 yards in the first three quarters. Jerry Warner's run ended the third quarter. Warner pulled off the play which practically won the game by dashing through the entire Kansas team for 33 yards to the Jayhawkers 33 yard line. This run was the greatest play of the game. The elusive little back dodging backward and forward through the Jayhawker team, five men touching him and none being able to more than stagger him. The Lincoln Journal Star. After Owen Frank's touchdown, the kickoff would affect the conference title. As Kansas kicked the ball back to Nebraska, it flew over the fence at the end line of the field. Harry Miner was the return man, and he went to retrieve the ball from behind the fence, but the referee blew his whistle before he could. That referee called for a touchback, which brought the ball out to the Nebraska 25-yard line. The other three officials did not see it that way. They saw a Kansas player leave the field through a gate and return with the ball, planting it in the end zone. They signaled touchdown for Kansas. Kansas coaches, players, and the referee that did not signal touchdown had a heated debate on the field. It resulted in Nebraska getting the ball with no touchdown by Kansas. The game ended on a failed pass attempt by Kansas at midfield. The controversy was addressed in the post-game press conference. The Kansas head coach was quoted saying, Nothing can be done about it that it was simply an unfortunate incident the referee making a ground rule for the occasion. He said the game was played between the goal lines and sidelines and according to the current rules the only way to call a ball dead is in the possession of a player or an incomplete pass. King Cole had a much more positive outlook on the situation. I'm the happiest man in the United States. Every man in the Nebraska team outplayed his opponent. As to the protest, Miner knew the rule and started over the fence after the ball. Masker blew his whistle and told Miner to get back down, that the ball was dead. Masker had made his decision and was man enough to stand to it. 
any idea of a protest is foolishness and too much of a baby act for such a school as Kansas to be guilty of. If Nebraska won their next game, it would give them the undisputed conference title. A loss would tie them with four other schools. It was a chilly November day in Lincoln. King Cole's coaching caused an almost flawless performance by his starting 11 against the Iowa Aggies. Fullback Harvey Rathbone had 14 rushes for 86 yards and three touchdowns. Jerry Warner added another 100 yards on the ground and through the air. Fans and media felt the Aggies were never a threat because they were outmanned at almost every position. It was official. The Missouri Valley Championship belonged to the Scarlet and Cream from Lincoln, Nebraska. The next 10 days were filled with light practices and gossip concerning King Cole for the 1911 season. Cole's position at head coach was in question once again due to the new conference rule against part-time coaching. All coaching positions had to be filled by teaching faculty members by the fall. Cole had the full support of his players, but the media ran stories saying that Cole was more interested in a ranch that he recently purchased in Montana his new acquisition consisted of several hundred acres of bitterroot fruit. The main growing season was spring and summer months. William Cole had a decision to make. The university was actively searching for a new head coach. If King was replaced following the 1910 season, he would be one of three Nebraska head coaches in a row, losing a job with a winning record. At the same time, the Haskell team from Lawrence, Kansas had been affected because players left to join the nationally prominent Carlisle team. At Carlisle, they were promised money for playing well, which Haskell did until 1910. According to the school superintendent, the program needed total reorganization. In former years, Haskell has been a name justly feared by other institutions. In the future, Haskell will play only high schools and second teams from small colleges. Athletics at Haskell are to undergo radical alteration and complete reorganization. There will be no training table and no extensive schedule with a southern trip. Students will not be encouraged to come here because of their athletic ability and a strict eligibility rule will be enforced. The imported men have been gradually sifted out. Others have been similarly eliminated with the result that Haskell has lost a great many games. Fundamentally, the plan is a good one and will succeed. Lawrence Daily World, Friday, November 10th, 1910. There was also the announcement of the cancellation of the Indians' next game against the Army team from Fort Leavenworth. Instead, they took the time to concentrate on what would be their last game, which was Thanksgiving Day at Nebraska Field. Years prior, the Haskell team would vary greatly from week to week with players from other Indian colleges, causing uncertainty on what the team would look like when they arrived in Lincoln. Last year's Haskell 11, for instance, had in its lineup that grizzled Indian warrior known as Roberts, who has played at Haskell and Carlisle under numerous sobriquets for fully 15 years, the Nebraska State Journal. The Nebraska squad was facing the possibility of not having Jerry Warner and Harry Miner for the Haskell game. To remain academically eligible, they needed to pass final exams. 
On Thanksgiving Day, downtown Lincoln was filled with 5,000 fans. Many were hoping the Cornhuskers would avenge their 1909 loss to the visiting Indians on the newly sodded field. Cole's starting offense included Warner and Miner. Luckily, they met their academic requirements. King Cole received a telegram that he chose to keep secret. His brother James had passed away and his family wanted him to return immediately to Chicago. For 12 days, Nebraska had been resting with but one scrimmage to keep the men in shape. Thanksgiving found the team in perfect condition, and the result was the most brilliant exhibition of football played by a Cornhusker team in years. Nebraska broke all records of the season, 20 touchdowns. The Cornhuskers advanced the ball 1,167 yards in 98 downs, while Haskell made 71 yards in 17 downs. Nebraska made first down 48 times. The forward pass was a great ground gainer for Nebraska, working successfully 11 times for 265 yards. The Lincoln Journal Star. Owen Frank pulled in over 150 yards rushing, scored four touchdowns, and kicked 17 extra points. Harry Miner matched Frank with four scores and rolled off three long runs of 30, 44, and 68 yards. Fullback Harvey Rathbone led the Cornhusker offense and crossed the goal line six times. At the end of the third quarter, the scoreboard read Nebraska 101, Haskell 0. William Cutler Cole Watch Sylvester Shanka run over six Haskell players reaching the end zone. King Cole had just witnessed his last play as Cornhusker head coach. He left the field with one quarter left and headed for the train station. Cole felt his team was in good hands and had funeral arrangements to make for his brother. Nebraska finished the 1910 season with multiple All-Stars and a conference title. The 7-1 record would not be enough to keep King Cole on the sideline. Over the next 30 days, players, fans, and the university made many attempts to keep William Cole in Lincoln. On December 18, 1910, Cole refused the final offer by the university, $2,000. By January 1911, he was running his ranch in Montana. Gus Lofgren missed the 1911 season after contracting smallpox. He served as a captain of the U.S. Army 41st Artillery from 1917 to 1919. Sylvester Shanka was voted captain his senior season. He graduated with his law degree and opened up shop briefly in David City, Nebraska. He relocated his practice to Cedar Rapids, Iowa. After a long illness in 1943, he died at the age of 59. He was inducted into the Nebraska Football Hall of Fame in 1978. The family legacy continued when his great-great-nephews went on to play for the Cornhuskers. Their last name? Walt Shawner owned a successful lumber company in Montana. Before losing his battle with brain cancer, he was a championship winning coach at the local high school and a respected sports official. Harvey Rathbone became one of the most successful real estate developers in the history of Lincoln, Nebraska.
Owen Frank served in World War I as a member of the Nebraska National Guard, Company E, 9th Division, and the 25th Field Artillery. Jerry Warner was named team captain in the summer of 1911. His final game was a 6-6 tie against Michigan and head coach Fielding Yost. He returned to Beaver City after graduation, coaching high school football, then joined the Army Air Corps and served as a flight instructor in California and Louisiana in 1918 and 1919. After the war, he returned to South Central Nebraska to ranch. His wife Marjorie passed away suddenly after nine years, and he dedicated his life to raising his four children. In 1959, his grain truck was struck by a train just miles away from his home in Beaver City. He was 71. King Cole never coached again. He spent decades in the Billings, Montana area managing his farm ground. He died in 1968 in Charlottesville, Virginia. He left Nebraska with two conference titles and a win-loss record of 25, 8, and 3. Dismay, but we'll do our level best. 